It's late January in Northern California, and John Miller's bees are on the move. Tonight we'll load about 456, maybe 480 beehives on this semi. It takes about 25 loads like this. This truck will be very near 80,000 pounds gross weight. They're good. Miller's operation is part of the largest annual bee migration in the world, and it's largely because of these. Whether you call them almonds or almonds, this is California's biggest export crop, exceeding two billion pounds annually. California produces almost all of the almonds grown in the United States. It's had a compound growth rate of over 9% for 20 years. And what's driving this incredible growth of almonds is its nutritional profile. It's a complete whole food, it's a, it's a wonderful package of nutrients, and it's very versatile. The successful almond grower needs to know a lot about bees. And Dan Cummings, who farms 9,000 acres of almonds and walnuts near Orland, California, is no exception. California has over 800,000 acres of almonds. It's kind of a staggering number to imagine. While there are native insects that derive nutrition that visit for pollen and for nectar, we need to be able to bring in these quantities of bees, the European honeybee, to effectively cross-pollinate each of these flowers. And so at two colonies to the acre, 800,000 acres, we require 1.6 million colonies, 60% of all the bees in the United States required in California for pollination of almonds. A third of our diet, over 90 different foods are depending on these honeybees that visit the almonds and then they go visit the cherries and then they make broccoli and they help develop onion seed all over the United States. The reason the European honeybees are so good at this job is that they're domesticated and we know where they live. So at night when it gets cold and the sun goes down, they come back to their house and we can load them on trucks and we can move them to the next crop. So these bees are doing real good. This is all new wax right here and that's an indicator that they're doing well. In addition to farming, Cummings also breeds queen bees, which he supplies to beekeepers around the world, including John Miller. Let me find the queen. She's usually in the safest, warmest part of the hive, which is usually the center three frames upstairs, and there she is. She is the mother of the colony, one per hive. Beekeeping is in Miller's DNA. His great-grandfather, N. E. Miller, is widely acknowledged as the founding father of migratory beekeeping in the U.S. A little more than a hundred years ago, there were no highways, there were no interstate systems, but there were railroads. My great-grandfather went to Southern California one winter and saw the orange trees in bloom in February, and March. I thought, if I could get my hives from Northern Utah in the winter to Southern California for this early bloom, for this honey source, he could make more honey. This is remarkable. This hadn't been done, and it's the first large-scale migratory beekeeping since the Egyptians oared them down the Nile 3,000 years ago. And there's another pollen carrier. Ouch! For the beekeeper, this is truly a labor of love. See, it's a nice day to be out gathering pollen. Somewhere out within a mile of this spot, mustard plants have begun to bloom. Somewhere out here, early wild daffodils have begun to bloom. And somewhere out here, bees are finding this pollen and bringing it back to the hive. That's like a miracle. This is last year's honeycomb. It's easy to share Miller's lifelong fascination with these industrious insects. And that's really good. But in recent years, they have faced mysterious challenges inside and outside the hive. In part two of our story, the urgent quest to understand what's killing America's bees. <laughs>